Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to be looking at the history of ARM. Stay tuned right after this. This is going to be an interesting story. Uh, I, I've had a number of people ask me for videos about this. So I, I'm going to start out with a quote by uh, Sophie Wilson, which who was one of the co-designers of the ARM CPU. Uh, and she said, overnight success takes 30 years. <laughs> it takes longer than that, I'm afraid. Acorn was formed in December of 1978 by Chris Curry and Herman Hauser. They formed it in Cambridge, England, and they wanted to offer a inexpensive computer to the home market so that, you know, the, the prices of the machines at this time were fairly expensive. Sinclair hadn't yet entered the market, but they wanted to produce one that was fairly inexpensive that people could afford. The first computer that Acorn designed was the Acorn Atom, and that was first produced by Acorn in 1980. It had a MOSTEC 6502 CPU, which of course was an 8-bit. It's a similar CPU to the Syntec that was in the Apple II computers. Uh, it had two, <laughs> I almost said megabyte, two kilobyte of RAM, and you could expand it up to 12 kilobyte. At the time, that wasn't too bad, but you know, DRAM prices, it, it around this time in, in the world were fairly expensive. Uh, yeah, so it, it had different modes for uh, its display, but the highest mode was 256 by 192 pixels, and that was monochrome only. But one of the things that it did have was it did have a basic uh, programming language that was designed by Sophie Wilson, although I think if... if if any of you actually use the Acorn, you probably remember that Acorn Basic was pretty quirky. Acorn, one of their claim to fame, though, was that they won the contract from the BBC to produce the BBC Micro in 1981. And, and I think that one of the funny stories about that was what Herman Hauser did. He had two designers that were working for him, and he said, he told Sophie that, hey, the other designer can get this done in a week. And Sophie said, oh, yeah, I'll do it even faster than that. And then he took what he took, <laughs> he went back to the other designer and told him that Sophie said she could do it in less than a week. And so the two got into a head-to-head -head contest to try to produce this thing. Uh, and I think she started on Wednesday and completed on Friday, but it had some bugs. She had to work all night, get the thing working to present to the BBC, which uh, worked well enough that they got the uh, contract from the BBC. Uh, this was in result, uh, in response to, I think, a program that was done on computer literacy. And so the BBC wanted to get a, a cheap computer out to their educational market in the UK, that kids could use and students could use to start to learn more about computers and become more literate in their use. Because at this time, home computers were not a thing. I mean, you didn't find a whole lot of them. There was a few, but not a lot. It was known as, they had a nickname, the Beebs, uh, and was produced from 1981 to 1994. What a long life that machine had. It, uh, there were several variants of it. The Model A was 235 pounds, and the Model B sold for 335 pounds, uh, and that would be in 1981 dollars, of course, or pounds in the value of the pound at that time. So they sold over 1.5 million units of that machine. So it was commercially quite successful, and I think that was what kept Acorn going. Uh, throughout the 80s, but uh, Acorn, uh, Acorn, they had. I think there was another version of it called the Master, which we'll talk about at least some of it. Uh, so in 1981, of course, IBM announced their IBM PC based on the Intel 8088. That, for all practical purposes, even though it wasn't a pure 16-bit, uh, it did have a 16-bit address space, and so yeah, so it it. Uh, that shook the foundations of the 8-bit world because they all knew they weren't going to be able to compete with them. Apple knew it. Acorn knew it. 
So, but Acorn, uh, they went back and tried to speed up their design. Apple did the same thing with the Apple II. In 1983, they released the Acorn Electron, which was based on Cinertex uh, SY6502A. That operated at 2 megahertz if it was accessing ROM and 1 megahertz if it accessed RAM. It had 32 kilobytes of RAM and 32 kilobytes of ROM. And they, they did pretty well with it. They sold over 250,000 units until it was discontinued in 1985. There were other models of the Acorns as well. I'm, I'm not going to go through all of those. This is about ARM, not Acorn. So uh, Acorn began to seriously think about how to compete with this 16-bit world. They knew that the 8-bit 8, 8 6502 machines would never compete with the IBM PC. And so they established a goal right away that what they wanted to do was to produce a computer that was 10 times faster than the current BBC Micro and offered at the same price as the Micro was selling for today. So a pretty lofty goal, uh, especially at that time. So Acorn started looking at all of the 16-bit offerings to see if there was anything that would compete even at any level with the IBM PC. And this was, I remember this quote, it was published in one of the uh, articles of, of Byte in an interview with them, and they said, well, they looked at all the 16-bit uh, processors, and they found that they were all a bit crap, that they all provided 4 megahertz in bandwidth. Coupled with that fact is that the 16-bit chips from Intel required a huge, well, I wouldn't say huge, a large number of support chips which increased the cost. So yeah, this was not gonna, this was obviously not the path them helping them make their goal. So, but there was a couple of uh, CPU manufacturers and designers, Motorola and National Semiconductor, that were just starting to uh, announce their 32-bit CPUs. And those were emerging about the same time as, as the IBM PC ramped up into production into higher levels of production. They looked at those two, and they found the same thing, that the the performance, while it was good, still wasn't at 10 times, and even the 32-bit required a lot of support chips, which would have increased their price in manufacturing the machine. I mean, if, if you probably remember, in 1983, Apple announced their Apple Lisa, the local integrated software architecture, it was, it was officially known, for a mere $9,995 for this machine. Obviously, it was a commercial failure. What events led Acorn over to, to ARM? What, what ha I mean, Acorn was the basis for ARM. So there were really two events that caused Acorn to look at building a chip of their own. And the first was a report by the University of California, Berkeley, on the benefits of reduced instruction set computing with a smaller set of a simpler design, you could get higher performance than the current machines being produced. The second event was on, had occurred on the same trip. They went to Western Design Center, which was producing some of the MOS versions. They had taken over the, the uh, uh, MOS design uh, for the 6502. And so Western Design Center was producing those CPUs. And when they came into the building, they noticed a bunch of high school students that were designing the CPUs on Apple II computers. It was pretty damn easy. So they, uh, so they, they decided, oh, I know what we're going to do. We're going to build it ourselves. So that's, that's what they did. They went back and they started working on the ARM Advance, which was called the Advanced Risk Machine. Steve Farber, who was a professor, I think, I think today he's at the University of Manchester. I'm not sure where he, he was originally, but he teamed up with Sophie Wilson, and they began working on the ARM M0. That was the prototype in 1985. And Sophie designed uh, the, uh, the instruction set simulator on a BBC Micro and proved to the engineering team that, hey, you were on the right track. But there are many groundbreaking things in the design of the ARM CPU. The first, of course, was the reduced the need for additional support chips by putting that functionality into the CPU. The second thing was uh, they, the instruction set took advantage of page mode DRAM 
which provided a two times a 2x speed improvement over the current methods used by Intel. They also uh, looked at vector like memory access instructions and added those into the chip and those helped wherever you could use vector math as well as uh, especially in, in graphics processing which as we all know is used pretty heavily today by graphics processors. So the ARM1 was really the first machine and board that was released in 1985. Those were produced by VLSI technology and they ran, those chips I think ran about six megahertz if I recall correctly. Acorn people put that into the BBC Micro which helped, it kind of put it in as a secondary processor and that helped in developing both the ARM instruction set and the instruction set simulator further on down the road. So, and then work could then become, could start on the uh, support chips. So the ARM2 released late in 1986 and that was running at eight megahertz. So there wasn't a huge increase in performance, but there was speed bumps that were offered on the ARM2 to 10 megahertz and 12 megahertz later on. It did have a 32-bit address space and only 30,000 transistors and it ran, outran the Intel 286. ARM3 added the four kilobit cache and it was then they jumped ahead and started working on the ARM6. It was at this time that Apple and VLSI both came in as partners with Acorn to work on future ARM designs because I think, I think Apple knew handwriting was on the wall. They needed to have a processor in place uh, that would, would be able to propel them into the future. Uh, I, don't, I can't speak to what internal uh, plans were but, um, at uh, Apple, but as you can see, that paid off later uh, with the development of the ARM CPUs and their current line of, of products. At that time, because of all the involvement with outside companies, spin this off as a, as a total standalone concern, and that's exactly what they did. They spun it off in 1990 to become the Advanced Risk Machines Limited, which is shortened to ARM Limited today. Uh, also, you, you'll just hear it called ARM. I don't think that they even recognize today that there was an acronym that was behind the name. I think that's just become ARM. Apple uh, worked on the ARM 6 and produced a the uh, Apple Newton PDA that was based on, I think there were two variants of the ARM 6 that were used in the Apple Newton, but that's been a long time ago uh, to remember that far back. ARM Limited began, uh, at, I don't remember exactly what year they did, but they had a number of companies outside of the design group that were interested in producing their own versions of an ARM-based CPU, DEC being one of them, wanted to use the ARM IP in the design of their strong ARM project. And so ARM Limited began licensing their IP in 1994 to several computing manufacturers, including them. But DEC had to give up the strong ARM IP to Intel as a result of a lawsuit settlement, which Intel used that IP to build their own i960, which they later they later came up with their own design, so they didn't stay with the deck designs that they had gotten from the uh, lawsuit. But one of the, uh, I think, looking back on this whole thing with ARM, uh, I mean, we all know that where they have, have, have come and, and where they're going is probably even more interesting. So one of the initial design hallmarks of the ARM chip was that it did not use microcode. Well, so what? Well, if you don't use microcode, you can build, you can hardwire that stuff into the CPU. The early manufacturers of computer systems knew that. All of the early mainframes were all hardwired. They all had hardwired backplanes because it was, even though <laughs> when you go step behind one of those machines, it was like, holy crap, who put all this spaghetti back here? Uh, those machines were very easy to design and really easy to change instruction sets out. All you had needed was a soldering iron and, and, a, and a wiring trace and you could do it yourself. But they were simpler designs for the silicon based as well. It simplified things and allowed them to produce chips at a much lower cost. 
Today, ARM is the largest provider of CPUs for the mobile platforms. I think we all know that. And in fact, it dwarfed the sales of Intel and AMD CPUs with over 7.4 billion sold uh, in 2022. ARM is projected, uh, has about, I think, uh, I think it's a little less than 1.5% of the PC market share in, in this calendar year, 2022. But they're projected over the next six years to to gain 30% of the market uh, simply because the machines are lower cost, they're easier to produce. We're starting to see some movement in that direction from the Windows side because Microsoft has, has released their version of an ARM-based machine. Apple, of course, has gone completely ARM except for their highest uh, performing workstation. Risk-based machines, how are those doing overall? So if you look at the market share that's that's done by Forbes and others, risk represents about 33% of the market share in 2022. That does count the mobile market. However, is it going to be Cisk that's going to win? No. Uh-uh. No. Cisk is flat. They are not expanding hardly at all. If they're growing by half of a percent, I would be surprised year over year. And it's been that way since 2016. All of the development and all of the market is going into mobile. I mean, if you look at the, yeah, where the research is, it ain't in the desktops, guys. It's over in mobile. Uh, however, ASIC, or ASIC is apl stands for Application Specific Integrated Circuit. That is expected to grow at an even faster rate than even risk in the coming years. So, yeah, I mean, watch out for that space. You might think that that's because of the bit miner, Bitcoin miners. No, no. That chip is, is a favorite device of a lot of consumer electronics devices uh, because it has very high performance and a very low cost, and it doesn't require a large a number of chips in order to support it. So I remember working, uh, it's been a, a number of years now, but uh, HP was working on something called Moonshot, which was a system that had basically, I think, uh, trying to remember how many slots in it it had. It was a lot. But they would custom design your application onto an ASIC for you. And I remember seeing a demo of it where they had taken uh, one of their internal applications. They showed the internal application running in a traditional machine. And the performance, let's say, was, let's say, I don't remember. Let's just say it took two minutes. But the thing over on ASIC took about half, an, about three or four seconds to run. And I was like, whoa, that's pretty impressive. Where are things today with ARM? So today, ARM offers its IP on a number. There's a lot of different licenses they offer. Uh, I mean, it's not just you can just buy the ISA or you can license the ISA to modify. There's a lot more in between uh, in order to satisfy all the needs in the marketplace. I'm not going to go through them all because I'd probably miss a few anyway. According to their website, no matter which license a manufacturer selects, it must be 100% compliant with the ISA. So I believe that might be shifting a little bit because uh, ARM is, is offering customization options for their ISAs. As I began this with a quote from Sophie Wilson, I'm going to end it with a quote from Sophie Wilson. She said, one of the first articles published on ARM said, our slogan was and is MIPS for the masses. The casting vote in each design decision was to make a final computer economical. And you know, uh, that that should be the goal of every company that manufactures a system. It should be, I want the highest performance at the lowest cost. I hope you enjoy this uh, brief history of ARM. And uh, I, there's a lot more, I mean, I could put in here about the latest, the later stuff, but uh, I think you get the idea of where they came from and why they came here. Uh, yeah, overnight success, 44 years. Yeah, 44 years. Anyway, hope to see you again real soon. Bye for now.